Okay, I'm going to spend a few minutes taking a look at chapter one, and here are the sort of main objectives of this chapter. We'll look at this idea of computer hardware and software, kind of the difference, which um, one of the basic concepts with uh, computing. Um, computing system structure, we'll look at that, like how a computer's put together. And data representation and storage, well, I'll actually leave that to um, part two. Um, but computer systems, uh, computing systems uh, structure, basically one of the main components of a computing system. And we'll also take a little bit of a look at computer programming languages and um, the integrated development environments, right? Okay. All right. First thing, computer systems, right? We have computer hardware and computer software. Now, the computer hardware are the physical components of the system, the actual, you know, hard drive monitor, keyboard, mouse, CPU, all physical components. Now, of course, the computer hardware really doesn't do much of anything until it has instructions and telling it what to do. And that's where computer software comes into play. And it's also, you know, the data, the actual information. So if you're creating like a word processor document, the data itself would be, of course, the you know, the document that you created and the software or the hardware instructions would be the actual program that you use like Microsoft Word. Okay. So here's some examples. Uh, picture and gives you an idea of these are all the physical components. So this makes up computer hardware. Okay. Um, there's other computer based systems out there now. There's uh, computer systems and all sorts of things. And here's a few examples of some of the things you'll see now. So, of course, you know, modern automobiles have computers in them. Um, that wasn't the case, of course, previous four years ago. All right, so there's other examples out there you could uh, think of, even like, you know, printers um, and other things. Okay, so here's the basic structure of a computer system. Now, I'm just giving you an overview of this, and you'll, you'll kind of get a basic idea you know this is a programming class so it's not really not like we're going to get into this too much but basic idea is you have the cpu central processing unit you know intel amd um intel has a, the kind of i the i series processes are pretty common now for personal computers and amd has their uh, processors also that are another common set but this is like the brains of the computer Okay, this is where all of the instructions that, so if you're writing a computer program, the instructions actually run on the CPU, okay? Now, they're connected to other parts of a computer directly through what's called a bus system, which is just basically, you know, a bunch of wires or electrical contacts that connect it. And you have RAM and ROM memory. Now, when you buy a computer, typically you, you, you know, you spec out some RAM memory, right? When you're talking about memory, you're really talking about this RAM memory. So if it's a, you know, 16 gigabyte or 30 gigabyte, pretty common now, um, that's what you're referring to. This is just temporary storage for programs in data, all right? So when you're working with a program, a computer program or something, it's actually stored in RAM while you're working with it and while the, or the CPU is working with it too, okay? Then we have our user interface devices, all the devices. So if you want to get information into the computer, these are ways to do it. And if you want to have information come out of the computer, of course, you know, speakers, monitor, monitors, both common and printing if you actually want to get a hard copy of it. Then we have other so-called, these are like secondary storage systems. Okay. And we also have um, what's not listed here, SSD. It's a very common way, secondary storage uh, type also. Um, basic idea, this is where all your data and your programs live until it's time to run them. So if you double click on an icon, what will happen is that, so you could double click on, um, Microsoft Word, <laughs> we'll use that example. What happens is it, the computer will take the program, store it in RAM, and then start to run it. Okay. So that's just really kind of a brief overview of the structure of a computer system, okay? And so the next thing is computer software, right? Now the computer software is just um, the instructions to tell the computer what to do, 
right? Here's some examples. So these are actually constructions, or, or you can think about it in terms of computer instructions or collections. It's a collection of data or computer instructions. So this is what tells what the computer to do. So like Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, or gaming programs, or you know, calculator program, or you know, any other word processing or, or notepad, are all things that are com collection of computer instructions, okay? And here's some examples. Of course, there's a lot more than this, and so I just put etc. Right. So this is like, these are the constructions, right? These are the programs themselves, and that's really what we're going to be writing. Something you know, a bit simpler than this, but of course, it's the same concept, same ideas uh, that are applied there. Okay. So this is where we get into computer programming, right? Computer programs are essentially writing the code to tell the computer what to do, right? And really, you're writing code that will be executed on the CPU. So it'll run on the CPU, all right? And the nice thing about um, the programming language that we're going to do, C++, is that C++ is what's considered to be a high-level language. So when we go and write the code, you'll look at it, it'll say, you know, the instructions will hopefully make some sense. One of them is called an if. You'll see an if instruction or an if construct, they call it. And the if one is like, if something happens, do this. If not, do something else. And we have like an if else structure in C++. And the idea, like I said, is if something happens, do this. Else something happens, do something else. And that's kind of like an example. We also have other structures that allow for us to repeat, repeat code, okay? And there's, what you'll notice is that it, the actual instruction itself will make sense or hopefully it will make sense. At least it's um, um, like you can come up, interpret it reasonably, I think, and come up with um, what it means without too much difficulty. That's considered to be a high-level language. C++ is a high-level language, okay? One of the things you need to recognize is that um, when you write, a write in a high-level language, what happens is that the computer itself doesn't understand it. All right, now the CPU cannot handle English-like statements. A computer is based on all just ones and zeros. So since it's based on ones and zeros, what we have to do is we have to go through a process of taking this English-like language, like C++, and converting it to zeros and ones, okay? Now, fortunately for us, we don't manually have to go convert it. We can use what's called a compiler, or another tool is called an interpreter. But a compiler is the main one. So the compiler, you push one button, the compiler will go through the process at least the, the development environments we're using, the compiler will go through the process of making all the conversions for you. And then in our case, what we can do is when we compile it, we create, we create what's called a, a build, build to compile, which is essentially just one button, fortunately for us. And it creates an executable file. And that executable file will, the link to it will just, you know, you could put it on your desktop or whatever, but when you double click on it, essentially it will go and ta take that executable and load it into RAM and then run it, okay? So the main points of this are high-level language is something that we can understand and work with. C++ is a high-level language. And a compiler is, is a tool, software tool, so it's a program itself that will take that high-level language, convert it to zeros and ones so that the computer understands it, okay? And like I said, fortunately for us, we have that. So we don't need to go to this process of converting to ones and zeros. What I will tell you is there's a thing, there's other lower level languages where you can actually, there's machine code. You could actually make the conversions yourself to zeros and ones and write a code entirely in zeros and ones. That would be tremendously long. It'd take you so long to get anything done, but it could be done. And we have a, what's considered to be a low-level language, too, and it's called assembly language. And assembly language is a language that's very close to zeros and ones, where you're actually writing 
the instructions one by one. So it's very detailed. So assembly language is a low level language. C++ is a high level language. And we're going to do C++ here. Okay. There's a lot of programming languages out there. All right. And, you know, there's most of these, well, some are high level languages, some are lower level languages. These are all languages, maybe like spoken languages, right? Or languages of the world, right? These are languages that different people have developed to use with computers. But the commonality here is that you could write any of these languages and you need a compiler or interpreter to convert it all to zeros or ones and um, the computer then executes from that, okay? So there's a lot of different tools out there and a lot of different compilers out there and the key point of a compiler or interpreter, it would have to understand that language, right? It has to understand that language plus the machine that you're, op you're running your program on, okay? So what to get out of this? There's a lot of languages out there, okay? C++ is one of them, all right? Okay. Here's another language, and, and I just want to take a quick look at this one. This is Python, and Python's another high-level language. And even, let's say that, you, if you wanted to know what this program does, right? Even if you didn't know Python, you never saw this language before, you never saw computer programming before, you could probably get an idea of what this does, right? What this program does. If we look at it, it's like, oh, okay, cash, ticket. Okay, so maybe this is a vending machine, that a ticket vending machine, right? You put money into the machine, and um, it looks like this is British, right? And so what happens, you put money in. If you didn't enter enough, total cash less than ticket price, this will actually go back up and prompt you to enter more money or ask you to enter more money, okay? And then if you enter, once you finally get to this point, it says, thank you, okay. Um, thank you, and that's it. It dispenses a ticket. Down here, it actually dispenses the ticket. But this one here, it says, if cash price is greater than ticket price, what do you expect? You expect to get some change, right? So even if you didn't know Python or hadn't seen languages before, you can get a, get a rough idea of what this is supposed to do, right? And C++ is that way too. It's, it's, you know, it's not the syntax isn't the same as this, but it's the same idea where it's a high-level language and it has structures that you can understand. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, here's another language, Java. Right, so this is Java. This is a, you know, this is an object-oriented language, so it's a little bit different. But you know, you could probably look at this, look at the words that are used. It's like, oh, okay, get accounts. This has something to do with accounts, and it looks like set ID, set name, set age. So, if you were just to guess and think about, or you know, make an educated guess, you think, oh, this is something to do with setting up an account, right? Okay, so. Same idea, English-like, you can kind of get an idea of it, what it's supposed to do, right? And like I said, the computer doesn't understand this. This Java would have to go through a, a compilation process or interpret process in order to create a program that the computer can handle, okay? Okay, here's our C++. So even if you don't know what, and you know, we're going to take a look at this, we're going to, we'll write some, we'll write hello world or hello at some point here, um, probably do an example for you shortly. Um, but the basic idea is that if you, even if you didn't know what this program does, you could look at it and see in here, say hello. Okay. So I think it says hello. Oh, what do I expect? Oh, it's probably going to say, it's going to display on the screen, hello, C++, right? So you can kind of understand that. And there's some other things in here, you know, we'll talk about it when I go through and create uh, your first program. And as we go through and as I go through and show you examples of um, code that, you know, I'll talk about each of these lines because each line has a purpose. Okay. So this is C++. And the only thing that this program does, it just on the display or um, on the console, it'll display hello C++. All right, so here's assembly language like I talked about it. Assembly language is another language. This is called a low-level language. It takes a lot more time to program than it would be if you were in a higher-level language. But 
it's more efficient because you would tell it exactly what you want to do, right? So there's not a lot of overhead associated with um, changing the code when the compiler goes through the process of changing the higher level language to a lower level language, okay? So that's, um, if you wanted a program to be really fast, they call them like real-time programming, where it doesn't have any extra code associated with it, that's just the overhead that the compiler might have done, that you write it in assembly, all right? Well, that's another language. We're not going to do that in this class. We're doing C++. Okay. So I spoke a little bit about this idea of compiler and interpreter. They're a little bit different. Both of them, you know, both have the goal of creating executable code. We're going to use a compiler in this class, okay? And the real difference, you can look at some of these other differences here, but the big difference is that interpreter will do one line at a time. The compiler will go through the whole process um, and create an executable code completely. All right. Um, this one is that it's, you know, it's, it's more um, platform independent. I mean, you can run on uh, more platforms. You don't have to. You could have this like intermediate code, um, or in this case, there's no intermediate code. This one just translates a program uh, step by step. Um, well, in this case, with a compiler, it's very directed toward a specific machine. Like it only run on like a Windows machine. Um, when you create, you know, with a no, Windows or an Intel processor, I should say, uh, and also in Windows, um, that when you make that, when you compile it, it creates a code very specific for the machine um, when it runs. But this is faster, but it's it's uh, not as flexible as the interpreter, okay? And, you know, just so you know kind of the basic ideas here, um, the compiler is what we're going to use in this class, okay? Not that I'm going to test you on anything like this. This is just to give you a general idea. So if you know, have you heard of these uh, names? Okay. So... There's a process that happens, okay? It's called a compilation, linking, and execution. So this is like everything that goes on behind the scenes. What the code we're going to write is, a, this is just a file name. This is just an example. It's up here. This is our source code. So when we go and write programs, it's actually just this program right here, okay? Now, there's some other things that come into play, and we'll talk about these, include files, headers, and it goes through this preprocessor. But what happens is that it creates these files automatically, compiles it. This is where it actually translates it to that object code, okay? Which is, they call assembler file, and then you assemble it. So this is like, this is, I should say, this is object code. Here is actually just um, not complete object code, okay? This is a file that's like an intermediate before it gets assembled and put into like the, the organized correctly. Um, but the basic idea is this is this is another file step that's created. Then it goes through this thing called an assembler, which is you know it's like assembly language. It actually has that low level level um, uh, system built into it. And then you have object code. And then you take it goes through the process and creates uh, it has uses other functions and other pieces of code that have already been built. It links them to this. So now you're using other programs or pieces of programs, links it together with what you created, creates a final executable file. So this is the final result. This is what runs, this is the ones and zeros essentially that runs, you know, your computer can run. This is what you start with. The nice thing about it <laughs> is that in the integrated development environment, all of these steps are just, you click one button and it goes through and does all this behind the scenes for you. Okay. And in class, well, you know, I'll take, maybe I'll do an example and I'll actually, we'll drill down and we can take a look at a little more detail, you know, the files that are created. We can talk about that. But for us, for now, you create your code up here in um, Microsoft uh, um, Visual, um, or Visual Studio Community. Um, it does all this for you with one push of a button. Not only does it does all this for you when you click the button, the run button, it goes all the way down 
creates this and actually loads it into memory and executes it. So it's one more step. It actually does that for us. Okay. But in terms of if you wanted to, you could just do the what's called a build. And this all makes up, this is all the build. So it build, start from here, go all the way through to here and create an executable. Okay. And, you know, I show you these details, although we're really not really core to this course. And, you know, I'm not going to question, I'm not going to ask you questions on this. The basic idea is, yeah, this is your English-like code. goes through a bunch of steps, and then it gets down to here. Here is the program that gets run on your machine. This is the one that's saved on the, you know, on the hard drive. Um, that's your executable. And all this happens with a click of one button, and that's it. Okay? Okay. So now we get this idea of this integrated development environment. And... Uh, Visual Studio Community is the one I'm going to use. Um, and basically, this is what it looks like. And I forget which version this one is. This might be uh, like 2015 or something. Um, but the basic idea, it's going to look like this. It might have changed a little bit. But we'll have different areas that we work with, and I'll show you that. Um, but, but this has a lot of things in it, a lot more than we're going to need. Oh, there's the green button, like I said. If you push this button, it'll take your source code, whatever you wrote in here, go through the whole process, convert it to, you know, object code, then convert it to an executable, and actually load it into memory and run it. And that's going to be, like, the most common thing that we're going to push here, okay? And we're not going to go through and look at everything on here. We'll look at a few things, a um, few things I think that are important for us to kind of get started. But recognize it has a lot of tools, everything all together to help us write code. Okay. Okay. Oh, and that's it. So that's that's the end of part one. The second part will be, um, you know, part two of the lecture slides will be we start to talk about um, the number systems. Computers are based on ones and zeros. So we need to talk about, you know, how do we get from like when we write a, write our code, we just use a base 10 or you know zero to nine number system how do we translate that and how do we go back and forth between our zero to nine or a base 10 system to a base two system which is only zeros and ones or basically on off states okay it's like turning a bunch of switches on and turning a bunch of switches off there are millions and billions of them on a computer okay so that's it for now for uh part one